Um, but do you have a joke? Do you have any sort of, we usually have... Uh, fucking told me um let me think what's my favorite joke mm, i'm trying to think yeah it's, it's hard i can't think on the spot now if i'm being honest but maybe maybe it's kind of like um it's kind of like an updog what do you mean an updog huh what do you mean an updog is this like some sort of like very useful thing <laughs> that's, that's the word. you're meant to say what's up dog and then i go not much what's you and then it goes into the fucking <laughs> I was like, I was like, oh god, this is some like young abbreviation I'm not aware of. Podcast. 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 Hello and welcome back to the podcast, the show where I have a new guest on each week to talk about them, what they do in the world around us. I want to thank Frankie for joining me last week. Got great feedback, um, the meditations of the anxious mind. And I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by none other than Roz Person today. Roz, how are you? Thanks for having me, Podge. Thank First you time. very much for coming oh on. My now, God. what is, because a lot of people who come on the show, it's, it's, they're a comedian or, or they're a content creator, like writing yours down, it just, the list went on and on. So like, I, you know, you're a model, entrepreneur, activist, charity worker, author, TV personality, podcaster, YouTuber. Um, I, I don't know how to describe setting up the community, the hype life. I don't know what way you <laughs> Like, yeah, I, I'm always like, leader. what do I, you know what, I don't even really know what to call myself. And usually, you know, it's only when I get into a taxi and, you know, obviously pre-COVID and they're like, so what do you do? And I'm like, oh, we don't, I don't think this trip is long enough. Or I just kind of tend to just give them a really, really like non-correct answer. I'm like, oh, I work in finance because no one ever asks <laughs> you anymore. <laughs> they're just like, all right, okay. Because like no one wants to, like no one is interested in beyond that. Because I'm always like, if I start by saying, you know, I do a little bit of social media, <laughs> it's very elusive. And then I go, what about social media? And then I'm like, I write cookbooks. And then like, oh my God. So uh, yeah, I don't really know how to describe myself. I never do. I feel like I just kind of have my finger in every pie of every pie that I'm interested in. Jack of all trades. Master of none. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah you yeah. can't really say that when you get into a taxi because you seem like crazy. It's like, what do yeah, you yeah. Jack of all trades. <laughs> Master of right. none. <laughs> They're like, okay. What is your favorite thing to do out of all, out of all, or do you have a favorite out of it? Yeah, you know what? You That's hard because, you know, I get asked this question quite a lot. And I think uh, they each kind of give something different to me. So obviously, you know, cooking and baking the natural born feeder that's a oh cooking has been a huge part of my life and obviously the cookbooks and developing natural born feeder as a its own independent kind of I suppose food blog and and page and community has I feel been able allowed me to kind of share my passion and cooking has always been very therapeutic to me so it's kind of a nice part of my job that actually benefits me and how I feel yeah. um and then obviously the high life community now I wouldn't necessarily call that I suppose I suppose obviously, you know, now there's clothing, but I wouldn't say businessy thing because really the hike life just started as a community based thing. Uh, I just started inviting people to come on hi hikes with me. So it was never really about developing it into anything else. It just kind of happened. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I don't really know. I kind of always find myself in new things, which I'm is exciting in itself. There's actually, speak speaking of which, one of the questions I kept getting asked was, um, Will there be more the hike life hats? There yes. People, people just I know, yeah. No, listen, I could put up a question box about like what recipes do you want to see? And someone's like, <laughs> when are the hike life hats back? <laughs> so yeah, no, they will be back. And it's just one of those things where I think, you know, if you ever develop if you're developing a brand or you're developing clothing, it's kind of always making it better, always trying new things. So right now I'm just obviously the hats are so successful as they are and everyone loves them, but it's like looking at new styles and new materials and, and, you know, different things like that. So I'm planning pre summer. So I'm looking at a, a kind of a new re summer launch and with the hats and just, I suppose with the clothing as well in lots of different sizing options. So uh, it's just kind of something I'm really working on at the moment, making sure it's perfect. Just getting the due diligence and making sure, cause it's, it's different. Like it's not as if you can just, you know, you make your like, your videos in terms of like cooking something it's not as if you can just do that with, with the oh no, you know what say, hey. i definitely underestimated i think the process of, of developing a clothing brand and i didn't really want it to be merch because i wanted to be like performance-based wear and the reason i kind of started the hats was purely uh to cover it was a cost covering project for the hikes because i pay for qualified guides to come on the hikes with everyone so there's a, a guide um a ratio of guide to hiker and um, so it was just really to cover their cost that's that's how the hat started and 
Yeah, I guess it kind of just grew from that. And I never really wanted it to be merchy or bad quality. Like I want to get really good performance wear. And I definitely think that there is a gap in the market for hiking gear that's actually really cool, really retro. Mm. And uh, I suppose... What if you done both? Like if you got like like really good high quality gear, but just with your face on it? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly, yeah, it's that's where that it's going. person. <laughs> It's like low alpine, but it's like low alpine. It's just like your face in what's around Mount Rushmore, but it's just like a rock. Yeah, and then it has like a little like ribbon around it, like it's a maple syrup bottle. <laughs> would, you, would you believe I've actually never, I've been on one hike in Ireland. Wow. Yeah, one hike. No, uh, you know what? Where, where was it? Belbunnen. Oh, Belbulben. Belbulben. What did I say? Belbunnen. I, I don't know. You said it really fast. I was like, Belbulben. <laughs> That's, in, I actually, I've, I've looked down here. I was like, Every time I have a guest, I always write down in my notes, slow down, because <laughs> I always speak far too fast. And when I'm listening back on the podcast, that's why I don't edit it anymore because myself, because when I listen back, I get so frustrated at myself. Can I give you advice on that, right? When I yes. first started, people used to always comment on how fast I spoke and how I suppose my accent and where are you are you from the country, yeah? I am from Offaly, yes. Not yeah. too far, actually. But yeah, I'll, not too I'm, far from Tip. Yeah. yeah. And it really got to me. Like, I went to elocution lessons for years. Like, it really, really upset me. Like, I could go on the Late Late Show and people used to write the most horrible things about my accent and how I couldn't speak properly. And I don't give a shit anymore. I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to talk like Philly Valley Valero and I don't care because, you know what, that's part of who you are. But you're well, you're, you're well spoken, regardless of your accent, you're well, you can understand yourself. My worry is I, like if I get excited and I start to speak fast, I'm, I'm much better at it now, but my voice and like I recently got braces. Um, so like now I, I, it's, I can notice it more prominently because my lips don't completely like stretch out to the, like sentence, like, you know, like my AOI, I feel like I'm doing an elocution lesson here to myself, but like, so, so it's when I speak fast, it's, I can't be understood. And, um, but I, I, I used to, I used to always hate people commenting on my accent because I used to get really like, I suppose insecure about it. Well, yeah. Like, you know, someone's targeting something about you that is a part of you. It's, you know, part of where you grew up and mm. how you've always spoken. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're putting yourself out there. You're putting that risk of putting yourself out there and someone straight away cuts you down right where, you know, that's a part of, you know, it's part of, it's not your appearance, but it's much more than that. It's your kind of identity. Um, and look, there's going to be some stage during this podcast where I'm going to get very excited and you're going to hear me speak really fast. It just happens. Well, are you telling me you're not? No, no, no. <laughs> is that what's that? Because I mean. <laughs> no, like it is, let's just put this in context, 5.20 and this is my fourth Zoom in a row. So I'm not not excited, but I'm definitely very chilled. You know what I mean? I'm like yeah. on that level now. Um, but yeah, no, when I get excited and I've done loads of elocution lessons, I still blah, 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 talk really fast. So listen. But sorry, back to back to our yeah. hiking. Yeah, Belvonen is the only hike I've ever. And would you believe it was only this summer gone by? I've never done, never done a hike in, in Ireland, which is probably mad yeah. to think about. Yeah, that is kind of mad to think about. Uh, did you find it hard? No, not really. It was like it was really, really nice. And now, and to yeah. be fair, it's only as of recently in the last year, I've gotten big into like running as well and more outdoor activities as opposed to the gym. I think that's more less focused on like the aesthetic look mm. of, of going. Um, while like I obviously still would like to look good don't get me wrong but like, more I actually want to like I'm training for a marathon something that I'm actually doing to, to get fitter so I've only been really doing anything outdoorsy in terms of like you know hiking or running recently in the last like year um, so and I how, would, did I, you, how did you feel after going for your first hike were you like a sense of achievement were you like buzzing I think because it was me and two of my best friends yeah. and I think the achievement was more on the incredible photos we had taken off each other um, as, as, as opposed to the hype but I felt, <laughs> yeah. it was like these photos are amazing look at this photo of you Ryan um, <laughs> but no it was it's, it's very nice like I can always appreciate a view oh, actually so, yeah sorry like I've done plenty of hikes outside of Ireland like I've travelled to America and stuff mm. like that and done hikes there but just in Ireland like there's so many I didn't realise oh, how is- many hikes there are we are spoiled for choice in Ireland. And I guess, you know, that's part of the hike life. It's just really identifying those hikes for people, showcasing the routes and how easy they are to access because Ireland's a very small country. Like you can go hike Donegal 
well, I live in Dublin now, but you know, in four and a half hours, you could be up there, which I know seems long, but if you're in any other country in the world, getting from A to B is actually quite long. So we're very, very fortunate that we've so many amazing places to hike and we can kind of, you know, travel through Ireland very accessibly. Um, and I also love that like, you're, you know, you've hiked loads, but it's always outside Ireland. I do think this year, even though it's a pile of shite, uh, has really made us appreciate Ireland. Like we're yeah. very lucky, like. No, you, I, I completely agree with you. Like we went, as I think the rest of the country did, went for a trip down west. And I, I, I had been to the majority of the places we went to. But because you've nowhere else to go, you kind of just have to appreciate it. And in terms of like other countries, certainly like inland countries, we have a, we have a lovely, lovely like Emerald Isle, as, as we put it. Like there's such nice hidden gem, not even hidden. But such and this a- podcast is sponsored by Discover <laughs> 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 my sister actually works for Tourism Ireland. That's good. I actually, um, my favourite, I, I, I would consider it a hidden gem, but my favourite part in Ireland, and I preach on and on about it on this podcast, is Sligo. Like Sligo is my favourite. Oh, favorite. Sligo's unreal. I, I, like, I, like, I love, awfully lovely, but like I've always preferred the coast. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Sligo to me is, is where I will like. You know what? I was looking at uh, buying a house and Sligo is probably the county I would go for. Go way where? Yeah. Um, probably if I could some way look down on Mullochmore, and I know that's kind of on the border of Donegal and mm. Sligo. So, um, I know a few people might write in and be like, she doesn't know where Mullochmore is, but you know, kind of in that general area, more on the Sligo side, if I could have a view of Ben Baldwin, that would be amazing. I'm asking for a lot here. Um, anything else? I'd also yeah, well, like a coffee I shop. I like it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lots of coffee shops around me, you know. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's, I'm the same as you, West is best. You know? Yeah, no, West, except yeah. for the when the weather's bad, though, that's the only thing. When the weather's bad, the weather is bad. <laughs> yeah, when the weather's bad, you know what I mean? You don't want to be going outside. No, you, do, like, yeah. you, know, I, you know, if it rains here in Dublin, you know, you can still go. I actually, I do love running in the, in the rain. That's my favourite. No, my... running in the rain when it's dark, you feel like you're in a movie. Yeah, you're but like, thank you. Someone's chasing me, go, go, go. <laughs> and you like feel the rain in your skin and you're like, Natasha Benefield yeah. is just delighted oh with me God, right now. Oh my God, I'm sorry. Every time I... The, I feel rain off on my skin. I think of that song. That's, everyone does. Everyone does. It's like, feel... it's like God, what age are you again? I am 25. 26 okay, in okay, a, yeah. two months. I love that. I think, you know what? When you are at your age, you're like, always like, I'm going to be 26 in two months. And then you hit 30 and I'm like, I just turned 30 two months. I just, just turned 30 two months. I, <laughs> no, I, I, I was like that. Like when I turned 25, I was like, oh, I'm on the later side of it now. Like I'm, I'm getting... And then like, it's not even that. It's It's... I don't know, like you, you, you don't make TikToks as much, but you made loads of TikToks and, and you're on TikTok um, and you're a pretty big following on TikTok as well. But when I'm on TikTok, I see all these like people who are like between the age of 18, 22 and, and they make these like funny videos and I can't get the joke. And like everyone's like, haha. And I'm like, fuck, am I out? Like, am I, am I out of it now? Am I out of the loop? Listen, okay. I was on TikTok the other day and they were like, this girl came out and she was like, so like, you know, if, you're born in like, you know, I mean, how did she put it? She was like, you know, if you're kind of old on TikTok, like you were born in the late nineties. I thought I was like, I was expecting to say the late eighties. I was like, are you shitting me? I was like, what? I, I, <laughs> Where I'm, you te- born? I'm technically the late, I'm, no, I'm mid nineties. I'm mid nineties. So anyway, yeah, that was <laughs> shock to the system. Uh, but also listen, I'm on TikTok half time and I have to come off and Google an abbreviation. Oh yeah. Like, it'll be like HB blah blah blah. And I'm like, what does that stand for? And I have to go off and Google it. And I'm like, how <laughs> how did this happen? Especially how did I lose touch of time this much? And Americans as well, like, on oh, God, my guy. And I'm like, oh, and you're just kind of looking up and you're like, ha, that that was a good one. Um <laughs> and also I feel like when you're younger, you think less about repercussions of what you do online. And mm. you know, I don't want to sound really old. I've sound really old but I think you know and also I think it has a tendency to do with like I've been in the media for you know 12 13 years of my life so you do become cautious of like just putting things out on a whim even if it's very funny in the moment um you do become quite cautious of that you know that's my my mother's like that like I always <laughs> thank you me. thanks Pod. yeah okay I'm old <laughs> fuck you <laughs> Surprise! Surprise! <laughs> but my mom is is now we do a very different sense of humor. So a lot of things she just want me to put out, I know would be okay. I think it's just that kind of maybe, and I don't think it's a generational thing. I think just her humor is very different to mine. Yeah. Um, but often I would make a video and, and I'd show it to her, and then I'd get a second opinion from my sister. Mm. And if they're like no, if the both of them are like no, don't, because I'm very because of like I've ADHD, so I'm very impulsive. 
and mm-hmm. I think something is funny, and and it might be funny to me, but often it or it could per- be perceived or you know taken up wrong. Um, and thankfully I have them, and they're like, no, like that is so bad. But 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 yeah, like you, you're right. Like I, I I now I'm more conscious of it now because I'm making more content yeah. and I'm kind of I suppose more exposed to the mm-hmm. online world. But once it's out there, like that's it. It's out there. It's it's you can't take it back. Once you hit that post, yeah. button, you can't take it back. Mm, but, and like you know, that's I suppose I. Uh, you know, I think when I first started in the industry, the social media wasn't really a thing. It only kind of became a thing, I suppose, when I was probably your age, 25, it started to become a really big thing. Now, I was on it since I was 20. Like, I started Instagram, you know, as soon as it came out because I was in America at the time and everyone was on it. Mm. But, you know, once you put something out there, it's always there. Um, and, like, I've been very lucky that, like, you know, I suppose I, I always had sisters who would always be like, you know, be very careful and I suppose I was always I suppose I came from that background of Miss Universe where you kind of had to be very conscious of what you said that you know luckily I'm I, I I've been very careful of it yeah. but yeah sometimes I'm on TikTok and I'm like you can't say that yeah yeah <laughs> oh, God, we got to stop but yeah. I want, you, you mentioned there Miss Universe because that's sort of I guess where it started you, you kind mm. of started into your modeling career you were 19 am I correct yeah I was 19 yeah and I started actually modeling when I was uh, 17 in Ireland and I had entered Miss Universe Ireland, I think, when I was 18 and I didn't win. And then it was the second year that I won and I went off to um, Miss, I went off to Vegas to do Miss Universe. Um, and then from there, I kind of went on to modeling in different parts all over the world and returned back to Ireland, kind of defeated a bit. Um, and then I kind of had my, I suppose, modeling career here and then kind of just left it, really. And when was it, when did you, I suppose, like stop? When was the, and not like, not when you actually stop but when was the kind of in your head like I think this I'm finished with this part well I think stop modeling in Ireland I was 25 and that was because I ha- was getting help for disordered eating mm. and I guess I realized my environment had a lot to do with why I wasn't able to let it go um, my huge fear of gaining weight um, and that I suppose that aspect that my job was based on purely aesthetics and I was always kind of rewarded or complimented when I lost weight or I looked very small that the idea of being in an industry that wouldn't accept me if I you know became myself and you know I, I gained weight I had to remove myself from it mm-hmm. um, so I didn't remove myself completely I think first thing I said like I don't want to do any more runway shows because they were the things that like gave me the most fear and triggered me the most, you know, arriving to a rail of clothes and kind of not knowing what you'd be put into. Was it going to be bikinis or was it going to be clothes that like, you know, they, they would, they would pick out the same sizes from last season. And I might've been an eight last season and now I'm a 10 because I'm in recovery and that being pointed out to me. Um, so that, that was probably 25 was when I decided I, I wanted to stop it. And at the time it was a huge thing for me because it was my only kind of source of income and luckily I adapted very quickly and I kind of and social media was growing at the time as well so I was very fortunate I could kind of shift towards more social media and not have to rely on kind of modeling jobs was it um like was the I suppose the the was the community like toxic would there be much of toxicity between other models or was it more internalized or was it a mix of both you know what it was definitely internalized for me I didn't I wasn't aware of what anyone else was doing or anyone else even looked like you know I definitely compared myself to other models so in for me I was probably competitive with other models in my head um but I wouldn't have said the Irish market was that competitive um but I was definitely very conscious of people around me because for a lot of people, you may not understand this, but when you have a, an eating disorder, like your whole life around, revolves around what weight you are. It affects every aspect of your life. It affects your relationships. It affects um, how you feel that day, how you're going to talk to someone else, you know? And so it just, I suppose it had nothing to do with who I was around. It was really all in my head and very much internalized, but I definitely... Uh, had to remove myself from the situation because I I do think, you know, in an industry that's based purely on aesthetics and, you know, the slightest comment like, oh, this size doesn't fit you anymore. Okay, we'll go get a bigger size. How that can actually affect someone in recovery so much and send them into a relapse. And I suppose I was at the stage where I had relapsed so many times, I kind of just knew I needed to get away from anything that was going to be triggering. 
Yeah, like, and what was it like talking about it? Because you're quite open about it now, but but I'm, I presume back at the time, and you've mentioned before that it wasn't like you you hid it away from a lot of your family and a lot of your friends. So when did you start becoming more open to kind of opening up about it? Um, well, first of all, I just want to back on like the size and there. I said from eight to ten. Like in no way am I saying that they're, you know, that's a big like change or shift in size. But for someone who is dealing with an eating disorder, like anyone making comments saying, um bigger or you look better with a bit of weight on you which was said to me numerous times sended me into like a complete relapse um and I went to therapy and I kind of took about three years to recover and I don't mean like fully recover like out the other side like I don't even remember who that person is you know it's definitely something you still manage and you cope with um and the recovery wasn't linear as I said it was definitely like I relapsed quite a lot it was very much um, up and down journey and I guess it was when I was about 28 20 actually probably 29 um, when I started to open up and talk about it and I, I always said I actually never thought about talking about it but I guess when I knew I was recovered and I was able to, to realize how far I'd come and realize how bad I was I kind of did want to share it because when you're really in it and you're you feel very stuck and I know for myself I always felt that I was really different to anyone else. Like this is just who I was. And no matter what help I got, I was never going to change. And I also kind of didn't want to let go of my eating disorder. It was very much a part of my identity. And for me to come out the other side and realize like I've completely changed, like I have complete food freedom. Like I have what I never thought I would have. I think I wanted to share that because there's so many other people who feel like how I felt and to hear from someone else that they felt like that too, but now that they're okay and they're out the other side, I think is probably, I would have, I would have benefited from hearing someone say that. Yeah, 100. But like, that's what, you know, it's great to have someone certainly in the position that you were in to come out and talk about it. And you, you're right there. You, you said it there, like nail the head. So many people look for, I guess, role models or people with similar kind of circumstance to, to I guess, help their own journey. And, and we we need that too. And it's just like, you know, with mental health, we preach about it all the time. It's so good to open up. And it's for that very reason, not just for yourself, but for others too. Yeah. And you know what? I was really conscious. Like I didn't, I was scared to almost become the go-to person for it because, you know, there's so many amazing activists out there for it. Um, And there's so many experts as well. Like, you know, I always credit my recovery to going to talk to an expert and going to therapy. And I went to um, a form of, it's called CBTE, which is like cognitive behavioral therapy enhancement. So it really looked at uh, my patterns of eating, where it came from and my own kind of self-negative thought. Um, And I credit my recovery to that. And what they kind of, I suppose, it's like, you know how I explain it? Um, Imagine like I had a basket full of apples. They basically had to empty all those baskets, those apples out and refill it with new ideas. So like my thoughts about the world, my thoughts about me were very centered around my weight and how I was accepted in society by being a smaller version of myself. Like I would be very successful being the smallest version of myself. things would be better if I was a smaller version of myself that was the best version of me and that you know society does applause weight loss and it kind of rejects weight gain Mm. and I had to kind of rebuild all those thoughts that I'd been kind of fed in my early 20s and teenage years and not only by you know people around me and I actually to be honest with you I I def I say this I I I would always have had a uh, eating disorder without the modeling industry the modeling industry just allowed me to prolong it and hide it for longer yeah and I think you know if we look at like social media and for me it was traditional media growing up it does give you a lot to compare yourself against oh 100 percent. and like even like like now the idea of for young people the perfect body it's it's like not obtainable because what they're looking at isn't real yeah and you know what if you notice the perfect body is constantly changing so it's like okay growing up for me it was the kind of Kate Moss era of like Paris Hilton and that wafer yeah you know no boobs no butt um and that's what you know we we all kind of try to emulate to be and now it's very much changed to a very small waist um curves and you know if you're constantly trying to be the perfect body and the trend it's so unrealistic for your body to keep morphing Mm. um and I think you know something you have to accept 
um, is that your body is meant to change, you know. That's one of the, but that's like definitely one of the dangers with 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 um, social media and especially with young people too. Is that like the impressionable, the impressionableness? Is that a word? I hope it is. Um, but the impressionableness of trying to obtain that. But one of, because I obviously I knew who, I knew who Ross Purcell was for like years. I actually remember I was at some event when I was like, I think I was like, I'm gonna say like ten now. <laughs> I actually, I actually, no, I was at like 15 or something. And I remember it was some music or some play or something. I don't know what it was. And then I remember, I think my sister or someone was like, that's Miss Universe Ireland. And, and it was you at the time. Wait, now, uh, was this in Cashel by any chance? So random. I don't know. It could have been. I mean, I, I can barely remember what I did last year. You know, week. honestly, I can't really, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit like that. Like I have a really bad memory sometimes to the point where I'm like, I think I have a problem, but anyway, um, <laughs> just, when you say you're from Offaly, I was like, what did I do that was near there? Um, I do think with social media right now, I couldn't imagine growing up with social media because you're seeing an edited version of somebody and you're comparing your life, your body, your day against all these people who, you know, even like myself, yourself, take a number of um, takes on a video or a photo. Oh, yeah. Um, but like, you know, there's a lot of people out there who are, you know, they, in fairness, a lot of them are open about it, that they use editing apps to smoothen their face or, you know, make body parts bigger or smaller. Um, and I definitely, I, I could imagine if I was growing up, like I would have a, a very big complex about that. But like, like I, I think I just thankfully, certainly to this the extent it is now, I I would say dodge that. Like I was quite an insecure person as a, as a kid, um, going up and and I would have, as sure mentioned before, my voice and stuff like that. Now not so much anymore, but I'd say like if I was on TikTok now, okay, um, well okay I am on TikTok now. If I <laughs> was on TikTok when I was younger, um, like I I get comments all the time taking the piss of, we'd say, like, my jaw or, or something. Because I have quite a... I have an underbite, which I'm clearly fixing at the moment. But that was for more medical reasons as opposed mm. to the aesthetic. But if I was younger and I seen the comments that, that, that I might get now, I'd probably take it much more to heart than I do. And I think you're... It, it's so... I don't know, I just find social, growing up now in Ireland, or not Ireland, but like just growing up now, you're exposed to so much more. And, and, and I just think it's so much... It's scarier. It's scarier to, to be a young person today. Yeah, you know what? I think there's bad and good. So, you know, the other day I was saying like, God, you know, kids going up in Ireland are exposed to so much more in terms of like, they're exposed to so much more information. They're exposed to so much more, um, I suppose, uh, different movements that can also be really, really positive, you know, and having an awareness, like particularly in Ireland with, you know, where we sit on terms of privilege and things like that. So mm. I do think young people are growing up with so much more self-awareness, which is fantastic. But then I, I suppose what you're saying, like the downside is we're also grow they're also growing up, I don't think I included myself there, growing up <laughs> with this with this idea that they have to look a certain way to be accepted. Um, and it's pretty much, you know, this has always happened in history. We just had it in traditional media. We just had it in magazines and things like that. Um, and I think it's, it is really up to platforms to have some sort of standard when it comes to this, like, you know, um, and I actually had this discussion online. I did a poll of like, do people think that if someone's uh, edited themselves in a photo, it needs to be declared? And, you know, the general consensus was like, yeah, but people probably won't see that or, or children or teenagers won't see that. But or even if they do see it, they'll still think of that image when they compare themselves. So I think the only way to really tackle this is like rebuilding and teaching people to actually like try not to, you see, comparing is hard. You can't teach it. Sorry, I'm going to scratch that. You can't teach them not to compare themselves because it's just part of your life, isn't it? Well, it, like, and, and for a lot of people it can be of huge benefit like take for and I'm just off the top of my head because I was watching some videos before this podcast is Kobe Bryant you know and there was a few interviews of him and he was comparing himself to the likes of Michael Jordan when he was younger and that comparison or people comparing him is what drove him and motivated him so there is like comparing yourself to someone else can be motivating mm. it's just what way in what way are you comparing yourself and, and for what reason? Is it because yeah does that make sense? You yeah, know 100% I definitely think you know there's obviously dangers comparing yourself aesthetically to someone especially mm. when you don't know their life so someone could be like if you eat this way train this way you're gonna look like me is like bullshit I can tell you that you know what I mean and you know also I think there's a huge thing with misinformation online with dieting and 
people claiming they do certain things and they just don't. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a dangerous area for kids and teenagers to be surrounding them, themselves in. But then I also look at TikTok and I'm like, maybe it's just with the ones I see, but they seem to have such a strong sense of self. Like people seem to be very confident on it. I, I, I think there's a mix of, of both because a lot of them as well. And just even from comments, like you'd see people commenting on TikTokers, TikToks, be like, I, I wish I had I, comments. I wish I had that body, or I wish oh, I had yeah. this, or even vice versa, not vice versa, but people making, like I've often seen videos on my For You page, and the content, like they wouldn't be funny, or, or they're just like a video that you might post. And I, I, I often wonder, oh, why has this gone viral? Because typically, you know, you can tell why something's gone viral. And then you go into the comments and you just see people slating them for oh, how yeah. they look at their appearance. And you know that that's the reason it went viral. And I was, and that's like, if I was a kid and cause, cause mm. people know why things go viral and, and children are very, not children. I don't want to say, teenagers are very self-aware in terms of what's viral and why it's viral. Mm. So if you created that, you probably know why. And I just, that's, that's what kind of it scares me. And I guess, I guess yeah. it, it's, and look, you know what, you know, I mightn't have the same experience in terms of, you know, viral or, you know, the social media and how it can impact. But I remember when I was 17, 18, when I first started Miss Universe, that, like there was blogs and blogs created about me, like just dissecting every part of my face and my body. And I was addicted to reading them. And, you know, the people would comment saying like, oh, she's so ugly she looks like a man um or you know she would be really good but like she'd have to lose half her body weight and just all these comments and they really really stuck in stuck with me and they definitely shifted and knocked my confidence so much that even when I won Miss Universe Ireland it wasn't like oh my god you know I I, I can't believe I won this competition I was like I don't know how I won this competition. I didn't deserve it. Um, so I think it definitely changes your own opinion of yourself, which is the most dangerous thing. Where people like, when that happened, where people are like, oh my God, like hop on, like you won. Do you know, it's like, stop being so like, oh, I didn't deserve to win, but actually you genuinely felt that way. Do you know when people are like, oh, stop, like you're only saying that, but like genuinely, that's actually how you felt. You know what? I actually didn't talk a lot when I was young, when I was a teenager. So oh. yeah. I, and that I, is... I, I talked too much when I was yeah. a kid. You know what? I feel like that's also a very sad thing. And that's why I always try to push the message to any of my young audience, like to just talk more to people. Because, you know, first of all, like talking about something is a release in itself. Mm. But having someone who's maybe not attached to the situation so much give you a rational explanation or an answer. Um, I definitely think, you know, when I did Miss Universe of Ireland, I had left college um, to kind of go do it. And I was away from my friends and I kind of traveled I know it sounds very glamorous, but it wasn't that glamorous, like traveled through country and country by myself. So it was actually quite a lonely time. So I didn't actually ever get to talk about what was going on or what I was experiencing. Yeah, there was actually one question I was asked. Now, I suppose this is in a different era of, yeah. of, of your life, but was what was South America? Because yeah. you moved to South America by yourself. Yeah. So when I was 16, I actually won a competition, which is called EIL, it's Experience International Living. What was it's it called? Experience International Living. And it's, um, so basically it's a competition that it's still run in Ireland every year and only, and one Irish person wins it a year. And they basically go off on a scholarship for like three months to a country. I think the country changes pretty much every single year um, to experience that culture. Um, and when I was 16 or I was actually 15 at the time, I entered it for the crack, like, you know what I mean? You know, when you're in school and your religion teacher's like, okay, everyone's going to enter this competition because I have nothing else to teach you today. So, um... <laughs> did, you, did, you ever, did you ever do that thing? Oh, I, I always did it for, like, you'd watch Quiz Zone or something on RTE or the Den, and then you'd apply in the hopes that you'd ever be on it, but, like, you know that the rest of the country your age is also... I was on the Den. No, I was on... I was on... Oh, you won't remember the show, which is so... <laughs> what was it? Um, I was on the Den as well. What, what was your show? So mine was Mary King and Ushing. Mine was Francis and and Francis and the the Dustin. Jesus, how Dustin, could I? Dustin, I love Dustin. I actually you know what? I actually know Dustin. Oh, do you? Yeah, I do. Yeah, he's so nice and he is hilarious in real life. Um. So anyway, yeah. Uh, I entered this competition and basically, you know, everyone was in shock that 
and they were like, oh, you've been shortlisted. Like you're like the worst people ever. And what did you do? <laughs> Who wrote this essay for you? But like, I think in one thing in my life, I was really honest. I, I think in my essay, I was like, you know what? No one probably thinks I'm going to get this. So <laughs> I'm going to give it a go. Um, so I went for the interview and I, I won the, the scholarship. So that was my first taste of South America. I went up to Ecuador for about three months and I lived with the family in Rio Bamba, which was like this very small village in Ecuador. And this was back uh, 15 years ago. So it was very, very like no phones, like none of the family, no one had internet or. Yeah, it was completely like, like, yeah, culture. you're just in their culture and you've no yeah, idea. Yeah. It's like and sending a, sending a letter like you're in World War Two. Yeah. Your mom and dad, how's Tipperary? <laughs> How are the mountains? And uh, like, I lived in a room that was outside the house. Um, okay. And I remember I went from like being like 15 to like. Were you also like, were you also working for them? Was, no, this, no, no. was this some sort of? <laughs> you know, and like I went from like being 15 to like straightening my hair to an inch of its life, wearing makeup to just like a very very you know simple life. Um, and I got to hike to Chimborazo Base Camp. I got to cycle through the Ecuadorian. I think it's Ecuadorian Alps. I could be mistaken, but I, I'm pretty sure it was. Um, I obviously learned Spanish We're living with the family and I got to go and live in the Amazon forest for three weeks in a camp. And there was a, a kind of Amazonian tribe that like taught me all their skills, like jewelry making. And the coolest thing was, it was like a, they'd have like this big kind of wooden thing and put an arrow in it. You go, and you'd have to like shoot things. I got so good at it. And at the end, we did a competition and I won it. And it was like pure luck. So um, it was an incredible experience. That was my first experience in South America. So I always felt like this big owning for South America. Like it was such a life-changing experience at a young age. And then before Miss Universe, I was invited um, by the people who run Miss Columbia to come and train in Columbia. Train for? Train okay. for Miss Universe. Okay. Yeah. And like, you know, in Ireland, you know, if you win Miss Universe Ireland and now when I was doing it, it was very much like, well done, you won. Uh, so your flight is this state and your best of luck. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so there's Roz, she's off now in a couple yeah, of weeks. She's off, do you know what I mean? So they were kind of very much like, we think you have you have a chance. So like, we'd love to train you properly, like train you. I think now, I'm, I'm, I don't want anyone to give out to me. I feel like now Miss Universe Ireland and Miss, Miss Ireland, they they're all very well trained I'm not saying I wasn't I'm just saying that I was offered to and like anyone who's listening in South America Miss Universe is like the premiership so they're like really obsessed with it okay so see if you context like they take it really seriously like any Miss Universe or Miss Colombia Miss Venezuela like they have millions of followers they're like on tv shows they're like major major celebrities right so I was like, listen, sign me up, right? And I remember asking my mom, I was like, um, can I go to Colombia and do, you know, uh, train? And it was only like three weeks. And she, her, me, her and my dad were like, oh, I don't know about this. Like, this sounds very dodgy. My dad was like, at the end, he's like, look, you can go just pack your own bags when you're leaving. <laughs> and I was like, I didn't understand what that meant at all. <laughs> anyway, um, so... I went over and uh, there was basically pageant coaches and I trained with them for three weeks. They used to like wake me up super early to go running. And I remember it was like the first time I looked at exercise as like a real kind of like, oh, this is pretty shit. Because <laughs> they used to make me like do sprints, like, you know, up these like really crazy hills. And, um, you know, in fairness, I thought I'd be on like a cabbage soup diet and they actually, they, they fed me. So it was pretty good. <laughs> um, and they actually taught me quite a lot about nutrition at the time you know um and you know going into Miss Universe I didn't have any issues with food yeah say that like I was totally fine with food um and I didn't really have a huge issues with my body like I guess I looked at the other contestants and I was like god they're perfect you know I wish I was like that but I didn't I didn't necessarily like dislike myself either do you know um so yeah I trained there for three weeks and basically just like you know like Basically, what you see in Miss Congeniality, that was that's what that's what happened. But were, were you not? You were in South America recently, weren't you? Well, not recently, but but not since you're. Oh yeah, and then so listen, listen to me. <laughs> anyway, <so> then, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Then I went to Miss Universe, right? Okay, this is right. And then after Miss Universe, I went back down to South America. I was in Mexico. Uh, did I go back to Colombia? 
I think I went back. No, I was in Mexico and Puerto Rico. And what, I was part, what part of Mexico were you in? Mexico City. I got arrested in Tijuana. Wow, you see, like you do not want to get arrested there. No, How I got did you get arrested. I got arrested for. I'm trying to think of the best way to put this. Um, I <clears throat> took a souvenir from a nightclub, but the nightclub actually turned out to be a strip club. And yeah, yeah, you see, like that's like that's like me telling a lie, it's like digging a hole. It's like I thought I was in a candy shop, but I was in a sex no, shop. No, I, I, I didn't get. I didn't. Get, like, there was nothing like they were there. I don't know how to put this. It was, they were up for grabs, um, and it was yeah. like a it was like a purple rubber replica. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, oh, what the, I was really joking. <laughs> but we were, but we were walking, but like with no money. So when, when we left, because we we no money when we were there. So yeah. it was just more the novelty for going to Mexico. And then when we were leaving, um, we decided to just walk to the border because it was uh, so many. Oh, the bridge! Were... There's a bridge, and you can yeah. The and there were so yeah. many people walking because San Diego is like where a lot of people work. Yeah, yeah. And then the police came up and 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 like turned the sirens, and I turned around, and they came up and they just searched us because to be fair, we were six really pasty Irish guys and stood out. Um, mm-hmm. and then and then they they found that and they were like, this could be considered a dangerous weapon. And I was like, it depends who you're saying it to. And they didn't find that funny at all. <laughs> but uh, they were just obviously, they were just trying to extort us for money because they've yeah. done, they done the same to the to other lads like a week later. If, if you're, that's why it can be quite dangerous. Uh, so you, you need to kind of have your wits about you because I've heard of a lot of go- stories, but, but mine's just, you know, weird because of what I had. On yeah. <laughs> Like I, was, I thought I honestly was like, oh, he stole a shot glass or something. And then no, I was like, no. a joke and say dildo. I was like, oh, it actually. Well, was. I didn't actually steal it. Like they were there to, to be like, yeah, you know, yeah, so. Sure. But that it was just obviously anything. <laughs> I actually carry it with me all the time. Yeah, yeah. all the it time. Was, Stupid it was just um, it was just because you know, like they would have arrested us for anything. It's just to, yeah. to extort money. But sorry, go on. You you were you were. Um. So yeah, I was in Mexico City and Puerto Rico, probably like between three or four months, and it was just because obviously Miss Universe is huge, huge, huge in South America. So I was just kind of to work there. Like I did like Dominican Republic Fashion Week, so, so I was also in Dominican Republic, and um, just doing all their fashion weeks and just shoots and stuff like that. So um, don't know where the Spanish <laughs> still. <laughs> You'd think I would, but I was actually fluent at the time. And just from not being back there, I've lost it all completely. A bit like um, Irish, you know? Well, I I can barely speak English at the best of times. So yeah, gonna... so. But yeah, no, I haven't been back to South America since. But like, what, what would be your favorite? Where was your favorite part in South America? Uh, I would have to say, oh, I'd have to say Ecuador. And like, I am planning to go back to Ecuador when coronavirus is over because I want to go back and hike there. Oh, that's just like... Uh... Like I love, I, I love to travel South America and Asia. I really want to go to as well, but it's just at this stage, you know, it's like when, when, when is this going to end? How are you actually, sorry, because one question I had for you was how are you finding lockdown 16.0? Um, which one? This is like the 19th lockdown we're in, but because, because you're hiking, you're like, you're big into hiking as well. So, so like you can't go on many hikes. So what are you doing to kind of keep yourself occupied? Usually I actually open up with that question. That was my opener question. And I kind of realized. You know what? I guess lockdown in general no matter what room we're on has definitely made me realize I looked at a lot of external things to kind of find calmness and like reset and not be so anxious so Mm -hmm. I think lockdown has probably forced us all to kind of sit with ourselves and not plan for the future I think as a society we're always like what's the next thing when's our next holiday what am I doing next week whereas now we can't plan for the future so we've kind of have to sit in the present and that's very hard it's funny because we got um, we were at a conference for work recently, and uh, do you know Conor O'Keefe? I'm terrible with people. Sorry. <laughs> he's a he's a he's a marathon runner, an ultra marathon yeah. runner. But he was on. He gave us a talk. It was a really really interesting talk talking about like, I think it was control the controllables, but like mm-hmm. you you need to focus on the now control the internal because you can't focus. There's no you can't change what's going on around you. All you can do is change what you yeah. do yourself and make like those like kind of daily habits. Mm. Uh, to kind of better the world around you regardless of what else is going around better your world regardless of the world that's going on around you if that makes sense yeah and you know I think you know for a lot of people especially if you're someone who's very outdoorsy person and uh you I don't I'm not gonna say rely but you know hiking is definitely my reset button it's been kind of being inside my head in my house and kind of being in my head is a 
like uncomfortable space Mm -hmm. and kind of I suppose being able to tackle how to work around that and also I'm not saying I've had a very easy ride in terms of you know locking inside all my dogs have just broken in sorry can we just just say hello my name is Willie that's Willie that's Willie (laughs) Willie and you have Myla but or Myla Myla, come here how many dogs do you have? Oh my god, she's so heavy. Oh, hello, I'm oh, Myla. She's gorgeous. Yeah, she's. They just burst in the door there. Sorry. No, you're fine. There, yeah. I'm. We 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 went to. Uh, we watched a foster dog, uh, because we were obviously oh, renting a house. Hello. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're just welcome. go on, Wilco, go go go. We're, um, <laughs> they, they were like, where is she? <laughs> we're renting a house at the moment, so we wanted to like because we obviously couldn't get a full time dog because mm-hmm. um went to foster when we weren't allowed because i have two dogs at home um, oh so you're fostering one right now we're not we're not able to either okay. we're not the, the, wow. have to respect the landlord's wishes um, no, although if you're listening <laughs> yeah if you're listening by the way there's a hole later. in your wall now <laughs> yeah, yeah. um yeah, so I just, sorry, where were we before that? Talking about... Talking oh, yeah, sorry, lockdown, yeah. yeah. So, like, I've had a very, I suppose, easy ride with lockdown that I'm able to work from home, which is fantastic, Can mm. you know, and there's been so many people out there have lost their jobs and lost loved ones or have been sick and, you know, or dealing with just har- horrible life circumstances through a lockdown and feeling isolated. Um, but I definitely think, you know, lockdown for everyone has brought a, a, a total different experience. I think the first lockdown, I was like oh my god I've been wanting to take a break for so long there's a novelty to it as well wasn't it yeah I was like like, I don't have to get on a plane I don't have to go anywhere oh my god this is amazing and now I'm like let me out let me out (laughs) you know the the weather is like the first lockdown beautiful sunshine and and it was it was that like you know we were in this together everyone was yeah. doing this and then the, the the problem was the country kind of opened again and then we got back to like somewhat of a i wouldn't say normal life because there was still no traveling um but like we got back into some sort of sort of a life it was like then, you know here's the taster we're going to take it back on it. you yeah and then yeah, like and and now we're going to take it back more yeah i think you know i <laughs> anybody can agree it's it's for everyone it's it's presented its own challenges um now i think whether the challenge was really hard or hard like it, it's all going to differ but um yeah it's definitely me made me realize i probably wasn't looking after my head as much as i probably talk about or you know would like to is it dip like is it difficult when because when you're someone who's so vocal about body body confidence and and do you feel a sense of pressure ever yourself? One thing, actually, I, I also want to mention in terms of, because I, I said, it, like, obviously I knew who Ross Purcell was, but the first time I ever actively actually started watching your content was when you posted, it was, it was your first post of, of your, the two photos side by side. I don't know what yeah. like, you, you call that, that series, but like, I, I remember being like, that is, because it was very, very different to people posting authentic photos. It was two really photos taken at the exact same time and it just showcased how different they could be depending on like lighting and stuff like that which was incredible and I'm, I remember watching that being like that that is amazing and uh, that's because I've never seen anyone really do that I've seen a lot of people posting these like photos being like love everybody but it, 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 when you showcase the differences of what a good photo can can do um, incredible so so hats off there and then that's when I started like watching your content and listening to you and then you were on the two Johnny's podcast and big fan of that so now I'm just a massive fan. But, but <laughs> Stop fangirling, bud. <laughs> this is just like, I, don't, I don't even have a podcast. This is just me. I just wanted to yeah, get yeah, it. Yeah. This is a lie. Do, um, but do you ever feel like a sense of pressure in that because you're, you're so vocal and people are very quick to, to jump um, on the opposite and be, be negative? Like, how do you deal with that? Well, I guess like in terms of, you know, my own body confidence, it's different for everyone, but like, I guess essentially it's just challenging your own self-acceptance and mm. like who you are today and like that there isn't a need for perfection. And I think that relates back to like the idea of perfection that you're going to constantly think the same way about yourself all the time is bullshit. You're going to have bad days. Um, and, you know, as long as you can, I suppose, turn it around and know that you don't need to change to feel like you'd, serve anyone better or be a better version of yourself um so with social media I definitely think that I think in general people put anyone with the platform on a very high pedestal yeah yeah. um especially if you're kind of 
opening up about your life and your life experiences and yourself, you know, and I think that's something, if there's anything I'd probably change that I do think I served myself up a bit too much for social media in that I think once you lay yourself bare, you know, you're kind of open to it. Um, and obviously I've just accepted that that's the way now. Um, and yeah, it's, I find it very tough because, you know, I'm not someone who's ever going to do anything perfectly. Yeah. And I like, I'm always like, I'm so sorry if I gave anyone that impression because, you know, I'm just like a human trying to muddle my way through life as well. And like, I'm fortunate to have a platform and I try to share what I think about every single day and share content, whether it's recipes or, you know, something I've learned in life to like make someone's day a little bit better. Um, so, you know, there's going to be times where you're not, you know, like you're not going to be everyone's cup of tea. Someone isn't going to agree with you. And like the biggest lesson like you can learn now going into like the public eye having platform is like, you were not born to please everyone and die. Yeah. Because like you physically cannot please everyone. Like there's no one on earth that everyone goes there and I mean, they do everything perfectly. Like, you know, that's just not how people work. That's not how the world works. And if you were someone who wasn't probably, you know, creating some sort of tension or someone disagreeing with you, you're probably not someone that has an opinion on something. And I, I have noticed as well from like a lot of like your advice, you very much give it from your personal experience as opposed to being like, this is right. It's all, yeah, it's, no, it's always, this is yeah. what I've learned from what and, you know, to me. I think that's, you know, I'm 30 now. So I think that's something that you learn. Like people don't respond to preaching this. Number one, number two, everyone's different. So if you're telling someone to do something, that's probably may not be the right thing for them. So you, you have to really learn to like, use your own experience to like just put it out there and let people mm. make their own decisions about it um but yeah like oh listen I hate preaching this like even in terms of anything like I'm plant-based I'm vegan but if someone comes on my feed giving out saying that I should go vegan I'm like shut up you like, <laughs> I'll eat meat if I want to <laughs> no but like you know I've I've that was my own personal choice just went for it. like I would never turn around to tell someone I would never turn around to someone and make them feel bad about their food choices that's just not me but that's like one thing I've, I always I don't understand with 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 people who are who are incredibly kind of preaching in terms of veganism you're never going to change someone's opinion if you're preachy I think we, we tend to hate being given out to and the best way to do it is more understanding or, or just kind of giving them information or here's healthier options and what you'll find is you're probably more inclined to get someone to change um I suppose change your habits or, or you know whatever it might be with no, much hello Oh, sorry, I lost you there for a sec, but I did get that. I did get what you're saying. Yeah, look, and I, and I think, you know, it's not even with veganism. I think it's it's everything, you know, if, yeah. I turned, if I turned someone even about, you know, body confidence, I was like, it's just as easy as just love yourself. Like, you know, it's not that hard. Just disregard diet culture and just love yourself. Like, you know, you should do this, you should do that. Like, it's not as easy as that, you know? Um, and yeah, I just think, you know, if it comes to someone's habits, like food, it's just, you can't, you're right. You need to, if you really want to help someone, you need to like help them understand, you need to give them options. And like, when that's for feeder, I'm just like, here's a tasty recipe. Give and it a go. Like, do yeah, I mean? and, the, and I'm sure people are like, wow, that was tasty. And then the gas thing is yeah. when they do try to like, this is, it's just, it's just being much more kind of compassionate. And I guess empathy goes, goes a long way. You, I, I noticed as well, or maybe I couldn't find one, but you don't have a Twitter page. No, I deleted Twitter, so I'm going to put my glasses. I feel That's smart. okay. <laughs> no, 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 oh, where'd she go? <laughs> yeah, yeah, where'd she go? It's Clark Kent on the screen. <laughs> no, you know, I've been on Zoom all day, so my eyes are just blue, blue like glasses. Um, yeah, I deleted Twitter um, at the start of the pandemic. I was like, you know, that's just not something I need in my life. Yeah. Um, anytime I went on, someone was kind of getting cancelled or someone or there was just like so it's either people go on twitter either to share information which is actually really useful i love that part of twitter like it's news or to give out so whether someone's just giving out about you know uh, a phone company in ireland or like someone's getting cancelled and i actually <laughs> 
I, I, I've been on multiple, well, no, twice rants on on a on a phone company in Ireland um, on, my, on my Twitter page. So I'm not gonna... so in fairness, like that's I think the only time I used my Twitter page in the past two years was to give out to someone. But like, and that's what I mean. Like, look. I think but that's, that's, but that's different as well, though. Like you're giving out about like an entity. You're not like there's a huge difference of singling out one person yeah, and enhancing yeah. them over something. Yeah, and to be honest, with you, anytime I go on, if I was on Twitter and I saw someone giving out about an entity, I'm like, you know, that wouldn't like affect me really. But it's just more like you know when someone starts threads about a person, and even mm. if I don't know them, like it's just that sense of like it just makes me feel a bit like oh. I don't really want to see that. Yeah. I don't want to see someone. And I, I just think as humans, we are not built to read lots of different and bad opinions of ourselves on a public platform. So, you know. What's that one? Tattletale? Is that, that's the name of it, I believe. Uh, I have no idea. I think so. Yeah. Because I, I see, I, see, I, see, I just saw, I saw. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I saw. Sorry, um, I saw a petition for that, and it's, it's just very. It's it's just like a forum where people want to give out about other people. Yeah, I kind of think with all those things, you know, maybe you know, obviously, I've been in this industry like thirteen years. Before that, there was something else. Before that, there was something else. But like, yeah. they're never going to go. So, like, I think by anyone talking about them or like doing petitions, set them up, is it useful? Like something else would just be set up instead. You're just giving that platform more of a reach or something. Um, and also, you just have to learn not to read them. Like, I, I can tell you, right, someone one day told me, uh, told told me, like, rumours about myself. And I was like, that was, I was like, I would love it if that was true, but it's not, <laughs> you know? So, like, like it's all bullshit. Like, you know what I mean? And, like, I've heard things and I'm like, that's a lie, like, you know, about other people. And it's just, like, you could go on and say anything and there's no accountability. What? Uh, is there, has, there, has there any rumour, like, you remember that you're like, oh, my God, that would be so funny if that was true? But like someone who was like, I bought a house that was like worth two million. And I was like, I wish, I wish. <laughs> I was like, are you shitting me? Would I be, would I be on like, you know what I mean? Do you think I'd be making videos for you if I had two million in the back? <laughs> do you think, do you think? You know, so like, you know, but like, it's just one of those things where I'm like, how that even started, you know what I mean? And I, I think throughout, throughout my whole life, I've always kind of heard whisperings of rumors that I'm just like, that's so funny. I wonder how that started, you know? Yeah, no, I I get it. I hasn't I haven't got there yet, but but when when I do, I'm like yes. Uh, you know what? It's funny because like I think you know when you're starting off, um, you kind of you know seeing someone like rumors about someone or like something scandalous online, you're like oh wow, like oh my god. And, you know, you're like, I'm not there yet. But then when you are there, you're like, oh, fuck, you bring me yeah, back, no. you take me back. And it, it is because I see sometimes younger influencers or, you know, people with like kind of smaller platforms taking down bigger influencers. And while like, look, hold someone accountable 100%, um, sometimes it's kind of like one day you'll be there and you'll understand how that feels and like if you're just spread like things like spreading rumors that you know not true or not asking for their side of the story just I mean things like that you know like one day you'll be in that position and you have no idea how that feels no completely completely agree with you Mm. I have two quick questions before before we finish up the first one was um I'm sorry, I have it here. Oh yeah, okay. So the first one, someone asked me to ask you about ghosts. Yeah, so like I have this fascination with ghosts and you know, whether I'm a huge believer in ghosts, I do, I actually, I do think there is such a thing as ghosts, okay? okay. Um, you know, I don't live with one. I wish I did. That'd be great content. But <laughs> how, would you, how would you know you live with, oh, just the ghost again? Look, they'd pop up, you know what I mean? They'd like, or they'd move shit. They'd let you know, you know? Um, yeah, I started a series on my Instagram where people send in ghost stories and I share them and I always share them at night time and, and people always mention me like, fuck you, I can't sleep now. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, and they're so interesting. Like I love, I love supernatural stories. And I think it's because I grew up with my dad, like convincing me there was banshees. Like he'd come into my room in the middle of the night and be like, do you hear that? And he'd be like, fuck, he's crying outside and be like, it's a banshee. Just and, I'd like, and he'd just leave and I'd be like up all night my eyes wide open being like <laughs> and you know like my I think my whole family like they're really and he definitely knew what he was doing as well and he's like no she's not gonna sleep <laughs> no and like you know it's kind of like my dad's a joker so you know I would be kind of we live in a really 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 old house it's like was built in the 1600s 
And, you know, I'd be like, oh, I think I saw something. And he'd be like, really? What did it look like? You know, he wouldn't be like, no, you didn't. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> he'd be he like, did. gosh, that was uh, Mary Jo down the road. You know, she's uh, the local ghost, <laughs> you know? So, and, and I think, you know, we grew up with kind of like that very storytelling of ghost stories and supernatural and kind of, um, I suppose, what do you call them? What do you call them? Like Folklore, Irish. tales? Yeah, no, I feel like there's another name for them. Like banshees and all that kind of stuff. Well, let me like, look. What are Irish ghost stories called? Superstitious, I suppose. Like, you know, superstitions. You know, like if you hear a banshee, someone's about yeah. to die. Yeah, yeah. So I, I suppose I grew up knowing all the Irish superstitions and, and I suppose taking that as gospel and being like, well, if the adults said it, like they're definitely true. And I still remember all the ghost stories that like my granddad would tell me. And like, they were always very specific, like what happened in the area. So I'd be freaked. You know oh yeah, I mean? I'd be like it. going outside. My parents would be like, "Can you go ahead and put this in the bin?" And I'd be like, "Honestly, like, is that that's the bin where Michael?" Got... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd be like running back from the bin, like looking behind my back, and like I grew up in the era of Goosebumps, which is like a horror TV show. For I, oh no, I, 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 I'm not that. I'm not that young. <laughs> okay, right. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, and I remember, like, you know, you'd have things like dolls would come alive and stuff like that. Yeah. So like I was always freaked by kind of the whole There's one I don't know if you remember one goosebump where a guy he killed a worm and then the worm colonies come back and kill him and then like they trap him and he brings him underground. It must be when I kind of was at that age when I was like, I need to stop watching goosebumps. That one I, I like that one absolutely freaked me out <laughs> yeah. for absolute years. Like I, I, I could not sleep. I was really bad at that. Yeah, you um, know, I feel like goosebumps that like affected a whole generation. And oh yeah, of- there's a film with like Jack Black, um, Goose. It's got like it's a Goosebumps film, and it's obviously based off of the books. Yeah. But like the film's like really like it's like a kids' film, and I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> that's not what Goosebumps was for us. Goosebumps scared the living daylight. Yeah. And some of them would actually be grand, but some of them are genuinely like genuinely frightening. Oh my god, they were awful, awful. Yeah. So um, I um, just kind of have a, I suppose a. a a ghost stories on my on my social media and you know on my podcast I do touch on ghost stories that people send in um mm. and some of them are crazy like some of them you'd be like if you didn't believe in ghosts you'd be like okay actually maybe I do now and if people want to listen to that podcast oh yeah if people want to listen just you know head over just type in Ross Purcell somewhere and it'll pop up you know I'm terrible yeah. at selling myself yeah because like, you yeah. know promote yourself I have millions of listeners, Ross, yeah. millions across the world. And you know what? It's, it's called Okay So. And it's called that because anytime I, I'm about to tell a story, I'm like, okay, so. Get me. I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly, I do, I do. you know what? I had the podcast done and it was the day before and they were like, what are you going to call it? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> and then it was like five minutes before. It was like the deadline of the exam. I was like, okay, so. <laughs> See, I was very lucky. My name sort of works with my name. Yeah, podcast. Yeah, it really does. Someone actually good. in America has a name called the podcast with John and Mary. Funny enough, actually, I think it's John and Mary. And uh, they sent me a really passive aggressive email when I when I started the podcast, asking me to ch- to change it. Yeah, like a really passive aggressive one, um, asking me to change it. And they were like, "We just feel like it doesn't suit your brand." I was like, "It's literally my name. Mm-hmm. Like it could not be more suitable. No matter what the podcast was, it couldn't be a more suitable one." My last question was Anna. I would ask you is you recently went on a walk with Mary McAleese. Yes. Uh, how was that? Uh, yeah, it was amazing. You know what, Mary MacLeese, we grew up in a household of women. You know, my sister, my my sorry, my father has three sisters and we're a household of three girls. So my dad is like definitely the one who singled out. Um, so having obviously Mary Robson and then Mary MacLeese as a president of Ireland uh, for such a kind of, I suppose, impressionable few years. Mm. period of our, of our lives was a huge thing. So obviously when I got asked to do and for all the kids out there, she was the president of Ireland. <laughs> um, so uh, when I got asked to all walks of life with Mary MacLeese, like I was like, oh my God, my younger self would have been like, what the fuck? <laughs> you've actually, you've met um, other presidents before. You met Trump a few times, didn't you? Yes, yes. Sorry. I was like, I was like, I haven't met um, Michael D. Higgins actually. Yeah, so like I was obviously with Trump models over in New York. Mm. So um, that was ran by Donald Trump. And Donald Trump also ran Miss Universe, or, Miss Universe sorry, Miss Universe. So, um, yeah, I've met him loads of times. Obviously, no. now, this was the days of The Apprentice. So, like, it was like... He was, was just a TV. He was a, just he a was, TV. 
he was just a TV guy, you know what I mean? And he was just like a, a billionaire, like Trump terror kind of like was in Home Alone. So, you know, he never expressed any interest in running for politics or anything. He hadn't become the real life super villain. Super villain no, no, he hadn't. Now. He hadn't. He was on the cusp. He was on the cusp. Like, yeah. <laughs> Roz, thank you very much for joining me. Thanks, if if, if people who don't know um, where you are, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish up, but then like I won't actually, and then I want to thank you personally. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but yes, Roz, thank you very much for joining me. If people who don't know, for some reason, if someone just, if my one of my million followers uh, was listening to this uh, and happened to stop it, where would you send them first? Because I think at the start, uh, there, there's so much, there's so much. Which pie would you send them to first? Um, I'd probably send them to my Instagram because okay. you know like I kind of I'm not I'm not really on TikTok I think you were very complimentary at the start saying that I was kind of very active on it I definitely use it I love watching videos on it uh, definitely to I my need Instagram. someone else in the same age bracket as me so I don't <laughs> I yeah, yeah 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 yeah. I feel secure um, and yeah. so um, just Instagram is on a personal and check out the Hike Life Instagram as well because we give lots of inspiration for different hikes all over the country so no matter where you are um, there's surely a guided trail for you on that Give me, give me where, when, when lockdown finishes, where, where's my first hike? Okay. When lockdown finishes, you're going to go to Ackle and you're going to h- hike Mount Krogan. Okay. Mount Krogan and Ackle. Yeah, yeah. It's really, really amazing. It's like the third highest sea cliffs in Europe. So they're way higher than Cliffs of Moher and everything in their class. And like, it's really like underrated hike. Like no one talks about it as much, but it's like incredible. And then straight after it, go down to Keem Bay for a swim. Oh, Jesus. Okay. Go for a swim. I thought you were sending me another hike. I was like, whoa, no, 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 no. No, no, your legs will be pretty banjax now. It's a short hike, it's about two and a half hours, but it's like this. I'll put I'll be putting up stories, but like, ah, yeah. here you Ross Purcell. Here you are. You are dead. young and fit. Would you stop? When I was 25, I'd be doing like that three times a day. Okay, well, Jesus. Uh Ross, thank you very much for joining Thanks, me. It's a pleasure having you on. And as always, if you want to get in touch, podge at the podcast out of your podge Henry, Instagram, Twitter, um, or TikTok. As you mentioned earlier on, uh, thank you very much. I hope you enjoy this podcast and I'll see you next week.